The Hallmark Playhouse, which is heard during most of the year at this time on Thursdays, has finished its summer vacation. So be with us when Hallmark Playhouse returns to CBS a week from tonight on September the 7th. Now, from Hollywood, it's time for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. Uh, Carl Brewster down at East Coast. Yes, Carl. Uh, I wonder if you'd do a little job for us. Sure, what is it? A policyholder of ours needs some protection. Well, I hope this doesn't indicate a trend. This is the second time an insurance company has hired me as a bodyguard. Isn't that rather unusual? Well, it's rather an unusual case. This girl, uh, her fiancé, has spent the past five years in prison. He's being released tomorrow, and he swears that the first thing he's going to do is kill her. Well, that's cozy. Mm-hmm. I think she deserves some help. Uh, come on down this afternoon, we'll talk it over. Edmund O'Brien, in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, East Coast Underwriters, Hartford, Connecticut. Attention, Carl Brewster. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during assignment on the Virginia Beach matter. Expense account item one, a dollar and a half cab fare from my apartment to your office. Well, well, you're prompt, Dollar. How are you, Mr. Brewster? Or did we set any particular time? No, I guess we didn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad to see you anyway. Sit down. Thank you. Now, let's see. Oh, yes, the Browning girl, Janice Browning. Uh, how much did I tell you over the phone? That her boyfriend was getting out of stir and was going to kill her. What you left unsaid was that she probably deserves it. Uh, what's that? I don't hold much sympathy for these dames that get themselves involved with some hoodlum and then decide to get disinvolved the minute the going gets rough. But it's your money. I wouldn't jump to conclusions, Dollar. This is a pathetic case. Of course, the girl made a mistake in taking up with this fellow, but five years is a long time to think. And she realized her mistake. And what did he go up for I believe it was robbery. You know, if she spent all the loot before she realized her mistake? Now, Dollar. Why doesn't she hire a bodyguard herself? Because she can't afford it. She has nothing. She turned to us because there was no place to go. Poor thing is in desperate fear of her life, Dollar. Surely you can appreciate that. Okay, give me the rest. And there's little more. She's living in Virginia, uh, outside of Norfolk, uh, Virginia Beach. Janice Browning, was it? Uh-huh. Uh, I have her dress for you. Her fiancé's name is Robeson. Uh, Mark Ropes. And he's due out tomorrow. From the state penitentiary at Richmond. Uh, just stay with her until we see what happens. She, uh, she was here, Dollar. I talked to her. This will not be an unpleasant assignment for you. She must have something more than a policy to knock this whole company off its feet far enough to hire a bodyguard. That could spell bankruptcy if it went far enough. <laughs> Expense account item two, $110, transportation and incidentals between Hartford and Virginia Beach, Virginia. Virginia Beach seemed hardly the scene for potential murder. A white strip of sunny beach on one hand and a friendly forest of pine on the other. I found Janice Browning's address just south of the village proper. A fair-sized cottage surrounded first by a small, well-kept garden and then undeveloped land. When I got out of the cab, I was looked over by a trim little honey blonde thing in shorts and halter who waited for me on the veranda. Hello. Hello. You seem to be carrying a suitcase. Are you sure you haven't been misdirected? Are you Miss Janice Browning? No, I am her personal maid. Who are you? My name is Dollar. I'm the investigator from the insurance company. Did you say personal maid? Yeah. Did you say investigator? That's right. Well, I hope you'll pardon me if I'm confused. I was not notified of the arrival of no investigator. What is it you want? Miss Browning asked for me. She went to her insurance company and requested a bodyguard. A bodyguard? Well, I don't know about that. But then there are lots of things I don't know as yet. I'm new here. But if she asks for you, you may as well come in. Thanks. I suppose you were surprised when I said I was Miss Browning's personal maid because of the way I'm dressed, if you'll pardon the expression. As a matter of fact, I was surprised that she had one. Why'd you say that? I'd been led to believe that she couldn't afford things like that. Well, between you and I, I haven't been paid yet. But she seems to be very generous. She turned over her entire wardrobe for me to wear at any time. 
Yeah, but maybe that's a bad sign. Maybe she's going to pay me off in clothes. And they don't quite fit, as you can see. How long have you been here? Just only three days. My name's Betty Light. I took the name Light from my stepfather. Just what are you doing here? Well, Miss Browning has a fiancé coming out of prison today, and she's afraid to meet him alone. Prison? Well, you could never tell. But I suppose it's her business. What is it? Well, if I was sweating out a fiancé after all that time, I wouldn't be quite so thick with what she's thick with. What do you mean? Well, if I were him, I'd feel cheated. She hasn't been wasting her time, from what I can tell. And in one week, that's plenty. But I shouldn't be gassing like this. Who is he? His name is George Masters. And if there's a fiancé on tap, he'd better be careful. Why is she afraid, as if she shouldn't be? Well, because she changed her mind about him and evidently didn't tell him about it. Sure, the same old story. Well, this is a surprise to me, but the least I can do is work out the wig. You know, Betty, I feel the same way. It was just past midday when I arrived, and it wasn't until almost five that a cream-colored convertible coasted into the driveway carrying a man and another honey blonde. I could see immediately how Janice Browning had swept the insurance company off its feet. How do you do, Mr. Dollar? I'm so glad you're here. Oh, oh may I present Mr. Masters? All right, Mr. Masters. Uh, I won't stay, Jan. I know you have things to talk over. I'll pick you up at seven. All right, George. Uh, bye, Dollar. I feel a lot better, too, now that you're here. I'll do what I can. See you at seven, Jan. I'll be ready. Oh, please sit down, Mr. Dollar. Oh, Betty. Yes, Miss Brown. I don't think we'll need anything, and I'd like to see Mr. Dollar alone, if you don't mind. Oh, by all means, Miss Browning. Could I have your permission to visit the beach? Of course, stay as long as you like. You know where the beach things are. Oh, I wouldn't think of encroaching. I'll just go the way I am. She's the strangest girl. Where'd you find her? She was a waitress in New York. I asked her if she wanted to come down for the rest of the summer. I thought she'd be company. But she's become so formal, or tries to be. Oh, would you like a drink or something? No, thanks. I suppose you think I'm an awful coward to scream for help the way I did. Well, I haven't heard all the particulars. I, I really didn't know what else to do. I thought of running away, but, well, I've made friends here. There's a simple fact that I don't have any money. How serious do you think this threat to kill you is? I'm afraid it's quite serious. But I, I don't know what will happen, and I wanted somebody to be with me. When did you see him last? Six months ago. I thought about it for a long time, about our breaking our engagement and which would be the best way to do it, and I decided to face him while he was still in prison and simply tell him I couldn't go on. Well, that wasn't the easiest way to hand it to him. I know, but it was the fairest, I thought. He didn't create a scene or anything, but I'll never forget his expression. He just looked at me and said, Have your fun. You've only got six months, because when I get out of here, I'm going to kill you. Well, now the six months are up. He's been let out. He knows you're here? Yes, he'll come here. Your friend Master said he was going to call for you at seven. Where were you going? Just to dinner and maybe a club afterward. I think you'd better cancel it. Why? I'll go crazy if I have to sit in this house and just wait. I don't want you to come back here after dark for one reason. If you can't go a long distance and stay, I don't want you to leave at all. The village is too small. If he knows it, he'll find you. I'll be with George. Look, you managed to put the responsibility of this thing into the lap of your insurance company, and they handed it to me. Now, I want you to stay here where I can keep my eye on you. All right, Mr. Dollar. I'll do anything you want me to. Good. Oh, uh, you might mix that drink you offered. Scotch, if you have it, and plain water. The rest of the evening was spent with small talk and mounting tension. The state penitentiary was no more than a hundred miles from Virginia Beach, and since it's the habit of prisons to turn out their guests at dawn, Mark Robeson had had plenty of time to make the trip. In spite of a sultry night, I closed and locked all the doors and windows, and by eleven, the cottage was dark, with everyone retired. The living room was the most strategic spot in the house, so I stretched myself across a couch that was too short for me and listened to the silence. It must have been some time after midnight when I heard a door crack behind me. Who's that? It's I, Mr. Dollar. 
Oh, you shouldn't be roaming around the house, Betty. I down near laid a chair across your head. Oh, it was too hot to sleep, and besides, I have a few things on my mind if you're interested. Sure, sure, sit down. Oh, thanks. Did I not understand you to say that this con was her fiancé? <laughs> That's right. Well, she certainly lives in circles, if you ask me. I happen to uncover some information that will knock you for a loop. What? Well, basically, I've never been a snoop, but I didn't go to the beach. Oh? No, after you advised me of the situation around here, I felt I had a right. I went into her room, which is no more than an oversized closet with bath. And it's a good thing I did, because in a drawer, I found a picture of Miss Browning posing as a bride. A bride? Yeah. Are you sure of that? As sure as I'm sitting here. And the guy standing with her was a bridegroom if I ever saw one, where they fancy. What do you think of that? I don't know. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. But from what I've overheard, this fiancé of hers has been in prison for five years. Yeah, that's the story. Then how come her wedding picture was taken in 1947? Was it? And that's what's stamped on the back of it. Now, is that screwy or isn't it? It definitely is. And there are some other things that don't ring truly. For example, this mug she is currently tied to. I heard her when she called him tonight, and it sounded more like... <laughs> he blasted your room. Get down the floor. Stay there. Hey, hold it! Hold it, Rose! He hadn't moved away from the window. He fired through it. When I got to him, he was still pointing the now empty gun at me, pulling the trigger and looking down at it stupidly. Get away. I won't go back. I don't have to stay in the hospital now. I'm all better now. Give me the gun, Robeson. It's empty. No. It's mine. You're one of her men. She always had men. No, I'm not one of her men. Let's go in the house and calm down. You talk like a doctor. Yeah, you're a doctor. You can't take me back. Get away from me. You told me to make myself believe that she was dead and I'd sleep better. Come on, Robeson. Get away. I won't go back. Let go. Don't cause any more trouble, Robeson. Now, come on. I won't go back. Let go, Robeson. No. Now I don't have to go back. Let go. I'd heard stories of the unbelievable physical strength of those whose mental strength has gone. I got his hands away from my throat by sinking my knee into his stomach. But there was nothing I could do to hold him. He lumbered off into the darkness and disappeared. I didn't need a medical opinion to know that I wasn't protecting Janice Browning from a released convict. I was protecting her from a homicidal maniac. There's the opportunity of a lifetime waiting today for any healthy young American man. An opportunity to begin a profitable and stable career for himself and at the same time to offer assistance to his nation, to the United Nations, in their present conflict against armed aggression. The United States Armed Forces need volunteers today in every branch of the service. You have the chance to choose not only the branch, but the type of work which you feel will be of the most benefit to you in the years ahead. May we suggest that you go to your nearest recruiting office now to see if you are eligible to volunteer and inquire about the many opportunities open to you. And now, back to our star, Edmund O'Brien, and the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Are you all right, Mr. Dollar? Yeah. Turn on some lamps in here, but stay away from the windows. I doubt if he'll come back, but he might. That brute is still on the loose? Yeah, yeah. Where's Miss Browning? She's still in her room. I heard her bawling, but she stopped now. Miss Browning? Yes? I'm coming in. Where, where is he? I couldn't hold him. Where's the light switch? No, no, don't turn on the lights. He thinks he killed you. He won't come back tonight. Well, why don't you go ahead and say it? Oh, I'd better not. As a matter of fact, I don't mind your lies or the way I was dragged into this. But what really stinks is you're hiring that girl because she looks enough like you to be mistaken for you at a distance. You give her your clothes to wear and you put her into your room. Well, she'd be dead now if she hadn't come into the living room. I I'm not trying to pass the blame, but it was George Master's idea. He remembered her and thought bringing her here might be a way to save my life. Robeson's your husband, isn't he? Yes, he's my husband. What's he doing running around loose? He escaped from a hospital in Pennsylvania. He's been there a year. He tried to kill me before he was committed. Why didn't you tell the insurance company the truth? I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. 
It was Mr. Brewster's idea to tell you that he was coming out of prison. He thought you wouldn't take the job if you knew the truth. Well, he was right, and I'm leaving the job right now. Oh, you have every right to. You can get yourself some protection around here. I couldn't when I tried. I went to every private detective in Norfolk and Portsmouth. None of them would take the case? No. Well, what about the police? What is this, county out here? Yes, it is. I notified the sheriff's office, and they promised me extra patrols, but that's the best they could do. How would you happen to turn to the insurance company? Well, George Masters is my lawyer. He suggested it. Mr. Dollar, I'm not begging for help or excusing anything I've done, but I've been half crazy with fear and the awful lost feeling when nobody would help me. I, I, I had to do something. What about your lack of money? Was that a lie, too? Oh, every penny I had has been spent on treatment for Mark. I borrowed from George on my insurance. I, I sold our house in Connecticut, and that money's gone. This property is all I have left, and I've borrowed against it. Uh, I guess you've had your troubles. Who can I talk to about your husband? You mean a, a doctor? Yes, I thought maybe a doctor might know what Robeson would do next. Well, Dr. Becker came on to Norfolk after he warned me that Mark had escaped. His, his phone number is in the little book on the stand. Well, I hate to bother him, but I'd like to have him come out tonight. Mr. Dollar? Yeah? You're staying? Well, not any longer than I have to. Say, uh, you'd better get up and have a drink. You're shaking like a leaf. I changed my mind about dropping the case, Mr. Brewster, not only because she was a beautiful woman in a tough situation, but also for another reason. I awoke Dr. Becker at his hotel in Norfolk, and after I outlined the night's events to him, he agreed to come out. It must have been a decidedly unpleasant experience, Mr. Dollar. On the other hand, you are fortunate to be alive. Yes, I guess I am. Robeson is only dangerous when his basic jealousy is aggravated. You say you arrived with Luggy? That's right. Perhaps he was watching then and misunderstood your visit. Oh, I get it. Well, what do we do now, Doctor? He probably thinks he killed her. Can we expect him to come back? Well, that is hard to say. He'll suffer a deep sense of remorse. Then he may feel that what took place was only a figment, a dream. The remorse would cause introspection and keep him away. The fantasy thought might bring him back to investigate. When? Oh, who knows? Tonight, even. Or tomorrow. Would he try to kill her again? Oh, yes, yes. An extremely strong fixation. Uh, do you want him to come back? Well, I want to see the end of this. That's the best way I can think of. I'll keep his wife here tomorrow, outside, so he can see her if he does oh, come. She's the one who really has suffered, the poor girl. I wish there were a way to ensure her safety. We could alert the police. Well, with the police on the scene, then he would not return. Shh, shh. Here she comes. Oh, hello, Dr. Becker. Oh, good evening, my dear. Oh, morning, rather. Oh, I'm so sorry about the trouble. Oh, I'm afraid it can't be helped. I was so sure at one point that he was responding to treatment. Oh, I know you've done your best, Doctor. Mr. Dollar, I may be imagining things, but I'm awfully worried. It'll be all right. No, I'm, I mean, I tried to phone George and there's no answer. It's after two and he should be at home. Mark knew that George and I have always been friendly. Would there be any danger to this man, Doctor? Oh, I hardly think so. All of your husband's aggressive urge was directed toward you, Janice. Well, could we go and see if everything is all right? I, I, I can't help it. I'm worried. Where does he live? In the village. It's not far from here. Could we borrow your car, Doctor? Oh, by all means, my dear. Here, here are the keys. You'll come with me, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I'm not letting you go alone. We'll be back as soon as we can, Doctor. <laughs> Oh, this is his house, the white one. Oh, there's his car in the driveway. There's a light on. Maybe his phone is out of order. I, I told him I'd let him know if anything happened. George? George, it's Jan. Oh, he doesn't answer. I want to go in. Yeah, let's see. Hmm, it's unlocked. George? Light's coming from a room back there. Oh, that's his study, where the phone is. Oh, well, we can check that then. Ah! 
George Masters was lying face up in the middle of a room that had been pretty well torn up by the struggle. The first thing I noticed were the bruises left on his throat by the hands that had choked him to death. I noticed another thing when I went to the desk to phone the police. There was a gun lying on it, and I would have sworn that it was the same police special Mark Robeson was carrying earlier in the evening. It took Dr. Becker to quiet Janice Browning after I literally dragged her out of the master's house and got her home. Well, I hope she can rest now, but she's dangerously near to mental collapse herself. Yes, I can understand that. Is there anything further that I can do, Mr. Dollar? Nothing now, Betty. Get some sleep if you can. Sleep? Who could sleep? Well, and spend your time packing. You're going back to New York in the morning. I certainly am. For me, you can give Virginia Beach back to the engine. Was Janice in love with Masters, Doctor? I think so. A great feeling of loyalty, at least. He had helped her so much with monetary loans and so on. But you said he wouldn't remember the association between Masters and his wife. Yes, I was convinced that he wouldn't. There was a police special in Masters' study. I'm positive it was the same one that Robeson used here. Oh? I tried to take it away from him. I couldn't. Now, why should he leave it at Masters? Well, I don't know. Say, did they know one another before Robeson broke down? Oh, yes. They were quite friendly. And they... well, good heavens, Dollar. What are you driving at? Mm, Janice borrowed from Masters on a life insurance policy. That usually means making the lender a beneficiary. I don't know how much the policy was for, but I'm going to find out. Well, I dislike having to agree with you, Dollar, but, but I do. In Robeson's warped mind, Janice was the arch enemy. It would have been quite easy for Masters to inflame Robeson to the point where, where he would kill his own wife. Oh, Mr. Dollar! Mr. Dollar! What is it, Betty? Well, he's back. That man, he came back. All right, now take it easy. You're all right. But I saw him. He was looking in the window. One, the one he shot through. Doctor, was... doctor, take care of her, will you? I'd better get back to Janice's room. <laughs> no more trouble that night, nor was there any rest. We knew that since Robeson had come back, he realized his mistake, and we knew that he would try to come back again. We agreed that instead of calling for police protection, we would let him return and try to handle him when he did. An hour after daybreak, we felt it safe to relax, and it wasn't until noon that I drove Betty Light into Virginia Beach and put her aboard a bus bound for the comparative safety of New York. Before I started the return trip, I made a swing past George Masters' house, convinced the deputy sheriff in charge that I had a right to poke my nose in, and got myself back into the study. I suppose it'd be all right if you'd go in. They took up all the evidence they wanted, I guess. What was that, Sheriff? Uh, all the things that pick up prints. Here you are. What do you want to look at? Some of his papers. I won't interfere with your work, but I'd like to know how he stood financially. You think that has something to do with it? Oh, I don't know. It might. They dusted all them drawers, so I guess it's all right if you pull them. He's a lawyer, you know. Yeah, I know. Say the field's wide open. A lot of people didn't like them. Oh? I didn't know that. What's that book? It's a ledger. Kept his accounts in it. What'd you find? Janice Brown. Who's that? Somebody he loaned some money to? Ooh, I'll say he did. Twenty thousand dollars. Ah, that's all I wanted, Sheriff. Thanks, and I hope I haven't caused you too much trouble. What I'd found was another link in a chain of circumstantial evidence that would never be used since George Masters was dead. He had loaned Janice Browning the thousands she had spent on treatments for her husband, and it was obvious that there was no chance of her ever being able to pay him back. The last notation revealed the fact that a $5,000 loan had been made on her insurance policy in April. A long-distance call to the company told me that the policy was for $50,000 and that George Masters had become the sole beneficiary the same month, April. Did I see no purpose in telling her, Mr. Dollar, or questioning her? I don't either, Doctor. I hadn't planned to, but the sheriff's office won't think twice about throwing it at her if it gets out. If you will um, allow me the privilege of perjuring a certain amount of expert testimony, I think I could manage to gloss over it. Well, the deputy saw it, but I don't think it sank in. Uh, I hope not. Of course, we're assuming that we'll be successful in subduing Robson. You said he would come back. I'm sure he will. It is you I'm worried about. <laughs> 
Well, I'll have to be ready for him this time. He's too strong to take without a weapon. I hate to do it. Oh, I don't think you need to be. The poor fellow will have no idea what is happening except that he has come back. Okay. Is she awake? Yes, yes, I think so. Well, it's three o'clock. She should be outside in case he's watching. Yes, yes. I'll go and explain our tactics to her. Good luck, Mr. Dollar. I hope all goes well. It seemed almost cruel baiting the trap, but it had to be done. We paraded Janice Browning through the garden in her most fetching get-up until dark, and then sent her in to sit in front of an open window. I don't know how she held on to her own sanity. I do know that I had a little trouble myself. I sneaked into a position outside the house from which there was a good view of all the approaches but the one from the north. He arrived at about 10.30. He was moving toward the living room window, and I started toward him. Hi, Mark. What? I can't see you. I'm George Masters. You remember? George Masters? That's right. It's your fault. She wasn't in that room. Did I tell you she was in that room? Your heart, George Masters. He made a mistake. I told him, and he said I made a mistake. You're the doctor. Get away from me. We'll do it right this time, Mark. Come here. George Masters is dead. You aren't George Masters. No, I'm not, Mark. But you have to come with me. No, I don't. I won't go back to the hospital. I won't let you. Mark. Ropes and don't. Get away. No. No, I don't. I'm sorry, Ropes and... I don't know what Becker is going to say to the police. But I do know what he learned from his patient after he was returned to the hospital and quieted down. Enclosed, you will find the doctor's confidential statement. He did go to Masters, hoping to ally him as a friend. Taking advantage of his escape, Masters armed him in the hope of realizing a profit from Janice's insurance policy. But Robeson, in his agitation, fired into the wrong room. And because he placed the blame for his mistake on Masters instead of himself, he became violent, and as a result, Masters was killed. Expense account item three, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account item four... And this is to you personally, Mr. Brewster. Payment for deceit in acing me into this matter, $500. Expense account total, $855.75. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Edmund O'Brien can currently be seen starring in the Columbia Pictures production, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive. Featured in tonight's cast were Bob Sweeney, Virginia Gregg, Gene Bates, Hi Averback, and Howard McNear. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. CBS is the star's address, and when you pay a daytime call, you'll find one of CBS' greatest stars, Arthur Godfrey, on hand to welcome you five days a week, Monday through Friday, for an hour and a quarter each day. Arthur and all the little Godfreys make life more musical and fun for you. Hear Arthur Godfrey's daytime program every Monday through Friday on most of these same CBS stations. To hear each and every star, leave your dials where they are, because this is CBS, the star's address. Yes, CBS, the star's address. Yes, this is CBS, where Philip Marlowe takes the case every Friday night on the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 